Welcome to the Political Trenches Local Government at Work, the podcast where Ian McCormack and I delve into the heart of the most significant municipal news spanning Canada from coast to coast to coast. Each episode, we unravel the intricacies, dissect the decisions, and explore the dynamic landscapes of local governance. But in our very special episode today, we are looking back on the last 12 months and discussing the biggest developments in the municipalities across Canada. We will also be giving you an update on some of the stories you have been reading and watching this year. But first, it is the end of 2023 as we know it, Ian. I'm not sure about you, but I certainly feel fine. How about you? It's the end of the year. We know it. I now I feel fine. You're channeling REM today or something? <laughs> Certainly, yeah, am. it's good. It, yeah. it is actually it was really an interesting experience too. Having a look at what uh, viewers or listeners had provided as the stories of the year, I was wondering though. In retrospect, I probably should have worn my Christmas sweater or something. But let's get going. There you go. So as Ian said, over the last two weeks, we have been asking you to submit your municipal news stories from the last 12 months. Now, we got a range of submissions from across Canada, including one listener who said that their top news story came from Saskatchewan, where after an in-camera session dealing with harassment claims and human resource issues, the regular meeting of council for the RM of Redford number 379 on June 8th ended early when almost everyone resigned. The meeting ended dramatically when Reeve Gerald Jerlinski tendered his resignation effective immediately. That resignation was quickly followed by Councillor Evan Johnson resigning. Quinton Sittler tendered his resignation of uh, Nathan Kellier, who was absent, then also resigned himself. Acting Administrator Kurt Kolenskuk, I hopefully pronounced that name right. If I didn't, I do apologize who had resigned earlier, asked if anyone else was resigning at the meeting, and Deputy Reeve Greg Sutherland asked for a minute to write out his resignation, did so, and left the council chambers, as had all others who had resigned. Ian, this is one of these stories that I didn't even know about until our readers brought it forward. Did you? I, I So I didn't know about this, the specific one, but it certainly is indicative of other things that we've seen around the country this year and beyond. Now, Saskatchewan is less than a year away from a municipal election provincially. So to have this sort of a mass resignation having happened there, I think is quite significant. Another listener submitted a story earlier from November when Canada's highest court had ruled that the city of Greater Sudbury was responsible for the downtown Sudbury construction site where a woman was crushed to death eight years ago. The Supreme Court released its decision earlier in November, determining that the city was responsible as an employer for the workers and work on Elgin Street in the fall of 2015 and can be held legally liable for the deadly accident. Again, Ian, these are great stories because these are not great stories, but these are stories that I wasn't even aware of were happening in 2023. Uh, When looking at this story, what, what did you think of it? The so the interesting thing to me, the particular or the, the the reason that it makes our list is as we look across the country, because this decision was rendered by the Supreme Court, there is quite possibly ramifications well beyond Sudbury and even Ontario about the role that local government plays in public safety and liability as well. So I hadn't heard of this much like you either, Chris. And but it is something I think that we could be hearing more about next year and even beyond potentially. So some of the other stories that people were listening to uh, or reading over the last year, uh, one uh, person submitted their top news story of 2023 saying that the big news story came out was strong mayor powers being tied to provinces building a faster fund. Another listener said that the ongoing drama in the city of Chestermere, Alberta, was on their watch list of 2023. And another one said that the biggest news story for them was the election of Olivia Chow as mayor of the city of Toronto. And one other submission that I just want to talk about for a second here is following a news story out of New Brunswick, where our listener said that they were following a story where a former councillor is asking the province and the courts to determine the role of a councillor slash mayor. With one big question at the heart of the matter, is a councillor an employee of the municipality or not? Ian, our listeners and viewers are watching some interesting stories, to say the least, across Canada, including some that you and I both weren't aware of. 
looking at all these stories that we got over the last two weeks, what 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 do you take away from them? It's uh, all politics is local. So this is uh, a case where the stories we are receiving from people are generally from people generally generally in that neighborhood uh, that have an impact on their own municipalities, but have a wider impact as well. Strong mayor powers in Ontario, for example, or you made the reference to what's happened in the city of Chestermere in Alberta, which specifically relate to those particular areas, but certainly have a wider impact. And that's the kind of story that we were looking for was what sort of things might be of interest to people who are who are listening or watching from BC to Newfoundland. And so I think to me, that is really the thread of some of the things that we've seen, along with maybe a lack of patience or lack of understanding or an increase in anger. Uh, those sort of things, unfortunately, seem to be themes as well. One of the things that I took away from these, and it's something that you say on the show a lot, and you have said it on a regular basis, so I'm kind of going to steal it, and that is all politics is local in the municipality. These were very local stories, yet with some national sort of consequences for a few of these stories. But overall, these are impacting local. Uh, in 2023, we are seeing sort of a drive for more local politics, sort of more local governance, being more engaged in local municipalities. Uh, and I, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here for a second, Ian, because that's what I do as the co-host and you do it in a few minutes for me but local politics in 2023 is going to be different than in 2024 i'm assuming because there's going to be a lot of more issues that are affecting municipalities do you see these major news stories that our listeners and viewers are uh, sending into us as sort of an indication of what's going to happen in 2024 i think so is the canary in the coal mine for some of them for sure um, whether it's got something to do with infrastructure or with governance or with the legal system or human resources, for sure. Uh, I'm also what I'm also seeing is national organization, national municipal organizations are starting to pay closer and closer attention to this too. Whether it's the the elected officials end through groups like the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, or in the administrators end with things like the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators, they're all starting to pay, I think, closer attention to some of these local issues to figure out uh, what the core of them is, how to address them potentially, because they will be of interest to their members across the country and maybe beyond as well. We see some things happening in other countries that are having an impact on us as well. So while we could probably chat about some of the stories, we want to get to sort of the heart and matter of what Ian and I thought were some of the big stories that were happening municipally over the last 12 months. Now, we want to first start off with a story that isn't something often talked about in Canada when it comes to municipalities, as it often can be labeled a dirty word. And it's harking back to our very first episode, amalgamation. In 2023, we saw municipalities in the province of New Brunswick go through massive changes with the amalgamation process in 2022, with the ramifications being felt in 2023. In Alberta, Black Diamond and Turner Valley amalgamated to become the town of Diamond Valley. In the province of Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotia Supreme Court judge has ruled the town and county of Antigonish have the legal right to ask the province for permission to amalgamate. While Amalgamation is a hot topic and is a dirty word in some municipalities. In 2023, from my perspective, we saw more and more municipalities working collaboratively to stage off potential amalgamation. Ian, do you think that the work that municipalities have undergone in 2023 to work collaboratively with surrounding municipalities has paid off? I think it's had to that there seems to be a bit of a pendulum at at, uh, at work here too. At one end of this pe pendulum is local autonomy with smaller municipalities. And at the other end of this is some places like megalopolises, if you like, like the greater Toronto area. And in between, of course, we move back and forth. But the whole reason that local government exists in the first place is to provide services and programs to the people who've chosen to live there. And so people need their plow their streets plowed they need recreation programs, those sorts of things. And how do you deliver those most efficiently? And so obviously when you start to look at things like economies of scale within a, within a series of boundaries, the larger the organization is, the more population there is to serve, the, the less it costs on a per capita basis. And so we've seen those things move back and forth as well. You made, uh, you made a comment earlier that sometimes amalgamation is a, a dirty word. 
I, I kind of think of it as collaborations, like you mentioned towards the end of it. Amalgamation certainly is a formal collaboration, but there are other informal ones too. And sometimes you made reference to Diamond Valley in Alberta. It's done uh, because two neighboring municipalities think they could be stronger together. When you look at New Brunswick, Wick as another example, where the provincial government decided that they were interested in reducing the number of municipalities for economy of scale reasons, that's true too. And even just to look at the state of municipal government in Canada, I just did a little bit of math because that's all I'm really good at. And I, I, I had a look at Saskatchewan because Saskatchewan has 774 local governments for 1.2 million people. So my math says that that's about one government for every 1,500 people. If you went to Nova Scotia, which has about the same population at a million people, they only have 49 municipalities, which gives them an average of 20,000 persons per municipality. So they're essentially delivering the same kind of programs and services, but I would suspect that Nova Scotia can deliver them a whole lot more efficiently and in a whole lot more sustainable fashion than a lot of the small governments in Saskatchewan can do, for example. <laughs> Collaboration has been something that a lot of municipalities are talking about, particularly with intermunicipal agreements in Alberta. We have service agreements out in Ontario. But I want to talk about sort of the reality that these service agreements, because the municipalities are feeling under pressure in, in today's world with the cost of uh, uh, the affordability crisis sort of uh, being exacerbating that issue, inflation uh, adding on to that issue. Um, in 2024, we're going to be going through, uh, so we're, we're currently going through a budget cycle right now. Most municipalities are going to be finalizing their budgets before the end of this year. Uh, I th believe even looking at what the budgets are going to be predicting for 2024, um, how, how much collaboration is too much collaboration at the end of the day. And it's a question that I've been wanting to pose to municipal leaders on my other show, but I, I'm always afraid to ask because you don't want to take the autonomy away from uh, what you have, but you also don't want to sort of stiffen your residents with the understanding that potentially your uh, tax rates are going to go up because we need to increase service levels. I, I take, for example, a story that we talked about earlier this year in Windsor, Ontario, where they actually subdivided residents into two different categories. So when they have a service, they will allow residents of Windsor to uh, jump on first, and then potentially a three 72-hour period, they can allow residents from outside of Windsor to jump on as well. Are we going to potentially see sort of makeshift uh, collaborations in the works in 2024, in your opinion? How much collaboration is too much? Or right amount, you said, well, I, my response to that is how long is a piece of string? <laughs> and just to say that it's it depends on kind of circumstance. We've seen historic collaboration on things where it makes sense to, to work with our neighbors, uh, emergency services, particularly fire, or regional, or regional service delivery for solid waste management or water, those sort of very expensive capital intensive things. So those seem to make sense. When it comes to the Windsor example and others where there are sometimes differential fees uh, charged for non-residents versus residents, it doesn't make as much sense there either. But I go back to my previous point about people still need the snow plowed and the garbage picked up and recreation programs delivered. So at that point, it makes sense to me when it makes sense to the people. And if you look at the political, the federal political representation across this country, there are some parts of the country that are staunchly conservative time after time after time. Others that have voted liberal since time immemorial. My guess is that the perspective on the role of collaboration of one form or another, formal or informal, might be different in those two uh, situations as well. Some may be fiercely independent, and some may see benefit in working more closely together. It It really depends on where you are. We are seeing a, a sort of amalgamation play out from a provincial standpoint. Uh, we do have a success story here in the province of Alberta with Black Diamond and Turner Valley um, amalgamating by their own will. We see it playing out in Nova Scotia with the county and the town of Anatonish, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. But in New Brunswick, it is a fascinating story because this is where the province has actually come in and said, you're going to start doing this. You're going to start working together 
together and you're going to amalgamate into one community, take mm-hmm. three communities, to add them to one. You talk about the 700 municipalities in uh uh, the province of Saskatchewan, and that is a lot. It is the one of the largest uh, municipal populations in all of Canada. Does it take political will from the province to do that? Because you, you've, I'm assuming, chatted with municipal leaders from uh, the Atlantic Canada for uh, these uh, through strategic steps. You do have a office out there now. Are you hearing from municipal leaders in Atlantic Canada, particularly in New Brunswick, that the amalgamation process was bumpy, but there was benefits towards it at, at the end of the day? Uh, yeah, definitely. If you look at New uh, New Brunswick, we have worked in New Brunswick in some of these places. These newly municipal min- amalgamated. In fact, one of them used to be six areas. Oh, and one wow. of the unique, it's not unique to uh, no, New Brunswick, but it is, I think, unique to Eastern Canada, in, or sorry, Atlantic Canada in terms of uh, provinces rather than territories, is there are some people now who are coming under the authority of local government, municipal government, which has never had a municipal government before. So the whole order of government was absent. And now all of a sudden we have people on councils who have never even been part of a municipal government before. So it is happening. I think places like Nova Scotia recently, if you look at um, Manitoba, 2015, 2016, I think they went through a very similar process. In in New Brunswick, it was interesting because I think in these new municipalities, the budget was provided, the, the budget itself was designed by the province. And each one of these new municipalities was provided by a municipal manager by the province. So the, there was a little less local autonomy than is ideal by a long shot. And that is starting to come out, uh, shake out as well now, as we come, a, I guess we're now a year, a little over a year since the last local election in Nova Scotia, sorry, in New Brunswick. And so there are certainly some points of strain beginning to show there because of the, the role that the province took versus the, the role of the, the people locally. Uh, for those who are watching the show, I do have another show called The Cross Border Interviews, and I actually sat down with the president of the Union of New Brunswick Minis- uh, Municipality, uh, Union of New Brunswick Municipalities, uh, Mayor Andrew Black of the Municipality of Tantramar. He is our last episode of 2023 that we did chat with, and he was one of these communities that did get amalgamated in uh, in New Brunswick. And I asked him about the growing pains, and he he says on the record, so it's not something I'm speaking out of turn, and this is airing after it, so. The Go back and check it out for anyone who wants to. Um, He does say that one of the big challenges that municipalities have when they're collaborating or even through the amalgamation process is merging those two bylaw groups together. For an organization, like you said, which had six communities merge into one, I can imagine that is just a nightmare of epic proportion. Here locally in the province of Alberta, Turner Valley, or Black Diamond Valley, sorry, I always get that wrong. Diamond Valley had two communities. They had to merge their bylaws. They're still going through that process. Um, is that tr- traditionally the trickiest part through the amalgamation process and even through the collaboration process as whose side is going to be the standard bearer of the uh, sort of bylaws and the procedures of any uh, collaboration process? I'm not sure you could say tradition ha- has anything to do with this because it's different every every place it's happened every every time it's happened. I've, I've seen it where we, if we're bringing municipalities together, where we're going to look at my bylaws, your bylaws, I'm going to pick the best one that relates to whatever the topic happens to be. I've seen others where they say, you know what, you've got a pretty good set of bylaws and policies. Why don't we use those and adapt them to two or three or four of us until we get a until we kind of get all the way through the cycle and we've got the rules that work for us. There is, however, I think something that's more significant, and that's the role of culture. And to me, culture is an outcome rather than an input. We, we all want a culture that means that the local government is going to be effective, that the people on the council are going to work with one another, that the people in the community believe in the efficacy of local government as well. And in some places it works, some places it doesn't. Some places have a virtuous cycle where they're building something better, and some places can't get out of their own way, and they end up with a vicious cycle where nobody trusts one another. And then we end up with some of the things we'd referred to earlier about mass resignations of various people throughout the municipality too. And it takes a real effort and a significant amount of political will and political capital to turn that cycle around. And it's not something that's going to happen over the next year or two. It's going to take a a goodwill going through an electoral term or two to make those things better. 
Now, on this show, we often are we're often at agreement on what the sort of stories are of the week or the every two weeks. But for this episode, we were kind of at an impasse for those listening and watching right now. Um, we were trying to figure out, both of us, what the biggest news story municipally was across Canada in 2023. Uh, I had I had my opinion and Ian had his opinion. So we're going to kind of split this next uh, part up a little bit. And I'm going to ask Ian to explain, because we both did not agree on the top news story, what his top news stories, top issue municipally was across Canada in 2023. Yeah, sure, Chris. And it's fun actually not agreeing with you from time to time because, ah! uh, well, it's not, not, not a lot of sparks that fly. It's just, it's good, I think, because... There's value in debate, discussion, disagreement. I think it just makes everything a little bit better. So it's not that I disagree that your topic, which we'll get to momentarily, is important. I just think that this one is something that has longer term ramifications. And we've kind of alluded to it already as we've spoken throughout today. And to me, the, the biggest news story for this year and maybe even for previous years is the role of abuse in local government. And by abuse, what I mean is the interactions amongst members of an individual council or between council and the public and vice versa, or between council and administration sometimes. We've seen things like um, high, very high turnover in CAOs after elections and uh, throughout council terms. And then there's a real, the, the, the ripples on that of course, are the cost of CAOs is expanding significantly too, and the number of people who are getting involved isn't. So I I would uh, suggest that the topic of abuse for me is the is the is the uh, topic of the year, new story of the year. You you have traveled across Canada over the last twelve months, and you have spoken to the Union of British Columbia Municipalities. You were out uh, in uh, Saint John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador uh, later this fall. Uh, you were in Nova Scotia for some time. When you're talking to administration and when you're talking to local elected leaders, are you hearing different sort of backgrounds and sort of perspectives on what type of abuse they're feeling? And what, without giving away too much information and uh, breaking any uh, confidentialities that you might have had with these conversations, what has been the biggest issue in the abuse realm that you have heard about and seen? Because you did have the Bucking the Trend convention earlier this year in Edmonton as well. Right. And that bucking the trend actually was it came out of a desire to at least try to explore and tackle this, this topic. I've been at council meetings not that long ago where we've had uniformed or plain, plain clothes RCMP officers in the gallery. So, I mean, it gets to that. If we start talking purely legally, though, about abuse, whether it's workplace abuse or assault and those sort of things, that's up to the legal system to manage. Uh, when, however, kind of what I'm referring to is what people call bullying. Now, I, I, I hesitate on the word because it's so subjective that I'm either suggesting that I am being bullied because I don't like you and I react badly to what you say, up to and maybe even including some sort of physical contact or threats, those sorts of things. So bullying to me is kind of the catch-all and we haven't done a very good job of defining uh, the uh, defining what it means, how to avoid it, how to call it out, how to, uh, how to stop it from happening to people within the local government and their families as well. And the, the what that's doing is, if we hearken back to the story about councils who resign or CAOs or other managers who resign, or people who choose not to run for, for council positions because they don't want a piece of that either. It's really hurting the body politic over the long term. It's, it's creating cultural chaos, and we get poor government out of it because those who are loud and demonstrative are sometimes being elected uh, through populist platforms where we're seeing people who know little to nothing about what they're actually supposed to do, but are sure mad enough to run for office and get enough angry people to, the, to elect them so that we're seeing real long-term damage being done to, to good local government and damage begets damage, which gets us back to that comment earlier about uh, the cyclical nature of culture. You, you've you been working in the municipal realm for longer than I have. You, I'm not saying that as an age uh, issue. I'm just saying you have been <laughs> dealing with municipal leaders a lot longer than I have. 
Um, the rise of social media in my conversations with municipal leaders is one of the catalysts that they are saying is the spark of abuse that they're facing as uh, elected officials, even from an administration standpoint. Uh, do you mm -hmm. think that's true? And how do you how do you stop abuse online without sort of negatively impacting the feedback that uh, municipal leaders are looking for? I don't know. It's a wicked problem, Chris. It's something that we can control a little bit, uh, but we certainly can't control those who are just being vicious. It used to be a case where two or three people would have a conversation at the coffee shop, that coffee shop Senate idea that I bring up from time to time. But now that Senate is, is virtual, digital, global, and some of it doesn't even exist in real people as we see the role of artificial intelligence now starting to come to play, particularly in larger municipalities as well and with bots and trolls and whatnot i think it and the safety of hiding behind a pseudonym and a keyboard and no images happens and there there was a bit of a tectonic shift i think that happened through covid where it became more acceptable to abuse somebody or a group virtually remotely than it would have sitting in the gallery although i have sat in galleries and heard significant degrading comments made about sitting officials or sitting elected officials or administrators as well so as well so the fear has sometimes dropped because of these smaller groups and a lot of the provinces will have them which a lot of times aren't making a lot of sense but sure make a lot of volume and take some of the fear away from others who may be following too i think sometimes local government is is now well, those who have who attack local government are ruled by the dunning kruger effect rather than any sense of logic one of the things on as we are coming to the end of 2023 we always look towards the future at the, as the new year approaches uh you say this issue has been ongoing for some time now and and i would agree with you in some sense that is the case mm -hmm. How do we fix it? How do how do we sort of? And I'm not trying to ask the million dollar question and ask you to put on your municipal wizard hat and fix this in one quick uh, soundbite. But what is the first step that municipal councils, municipal administration can take in 2024 to help solve some of these issues that municipal staff are facing and municipal leaders are facing in the abuse realm? Yeah, I, I tell councils or administrators two different things. One is you've got to both have the rules in place and you have to use the rules. Having a rule, a bylaw, or a policy that never gets used, code around code of conduct or respectful workplaces or how the people in the gallery are supposed to act. If you've got that, never, never enforce it. It doesn't really exist in the first place. The second, and perhaps most importantly, is about modeling the behavior you expect in others. So if council is going off on each other, um, in a council chamber, and we're seeing a lot more council code of conduct complaints or code of ethics complaints now, and integrity commissioners are getting involved. So until that changes, I think we're going to see it's going to be hard to see changes elsewhere in the municipal realm because it's acceptable behavior if council's doing it. How can we call out people uh, either on the street or people in the gallery when they're doing exactly the same thing as their elected officials are doing? So model the behavior, follow the rules. Are the two things I'd suggest. Well, Chris, for the first time ever, I think I'm going to turn the tables on you. And rather than being an interviewer, interviewer, you're going to be the interviewee for a while. And this became necessary because you and I disagreed on what the kind of what we think the top story of the year is. And I have noticed uh, because you are the person who, of course, sets up this, this, this the way the show runs, that you get the last word on this. And I don't think that that's particularly coincidental. Anyway. So whereas I thought that the top story of the year was around abuse, you have suggested that the top story of the year is around infrastructure and some things more specific to infrastructure. Can you tell me a little bit about kind of what you mean as the top story of the year and why you chose it? Well, the reason why I chose infrastructure, and I think this is it gets to the sort of the crux of what I have been hearing from municipal leaders from across Canada, is municipalities can only run balance budgets every year. They cannot run deficits and they are the holders of 60% of the infrastructure that is in this country. And when we are in the midst of aging infrastructure, when I speak to municipal leaders, I hear about 30 year old pipes, 60 year old pipes, 50 year old sewage lines that need to be upgraded. There are potentially issues with uh, deficits of growing communities that the federal and provincial governments have set in place. 
with municipalities sort of being the front line, as you will, of building this infrastructure, the province and federal government haven't stepped up to the plate in 2023. FCM, since I have started uh, speaking with municipal leaders earlier in February of this year, uh, FCM has been calling on the federal government and provincial government to come to the table for a new fiscal framework uh, around uh, infrastructure, around funding of municipalities. Uh, we have not seen any movement on this, and this has left municipalities sort of carrying the bag, if you will, of trying to address the infrastructure needs in a in a 2023 uh, scenario with a 1900s uh, tax rate. So municipalities are trying to navigate how they're going to grow their communities to add these houses that the federal government and the provincial governments are mandating them to, uh, particularly in Ontario, where we see strong mayor powers saying, we need to build more houses. I think the Federation of Canadian Municipalities just came out with a stat saying, I think 5.8 million new houses need to be built over the next, uh, I think, five to 10 years. That is a lot of housing. And I don't care where you are. And that's not just in one province, that's across Canada. So when I talk about infrastructure, when I hear municipal leaders talk about infrastructure, it is the reality that if they do not uh, come to the table, the province and the federal government come to the table to address this issues with municipalities, uh, we are going to see tax rates in the range of 10 to 15 percent over the next few years. In particular, look at what happened just this year alone. Calgary saw a 7.8 percent tax increase because they are infrastructure needs that need to be updated. Yes, there are other things that are going on with that 7.8%, but we are seeing downloading of services. And that means that those services are being covered by money that could be potentially going to infrastructure. So when I thought about the biggest news story in 2023, I think it had to be infrastructure because there has been calls time in memoriam in 2023 from municipal leaders of all sizes, from the smallest summer village to the resort villages in Saskatchewan to the large cities in Toronto. Infrastructure has been on the top of mind for a lot of mayors and councillors, and it just doesn't seem like any movement has happened at all in 2023 around infrastructure. Fascinating. Infrastructure is just such a sexy word, though, too, Chris. I can't, I can't see why. I did have a mayor once tell me that. The problem with infrastructure, or one of the political problems with deep infrastructure anyway, was that no mayor wants to cut the ribbon on a sewer line. And that's symbolic of, of kind of where they're getting their 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 political kudos from as well. Um, I, I I wonder too, I mean, I, I said a little while ago that all politics is local. Well, all sewer lines are local as well. So from this, do you see this, the condition of infrastructure, the lack of upkeep, asset management, all that thing as, as like a, a, a cause or an effect? Like, is this a symptom of something else? And if so, what is the something else? Well, it, and this is where I was looking at it from, because uh, I, I I traditionally bring the political perspective to the show and you traditionally bring the uh sort of the council perspective to the show, if you will, and sort of the, hey, let's have a level head. And I'm like, let's talk about politics because this is what I like to talk about. I think it has a few issues that are working uh, against this infrastructure infrastructure. Um, right now we are seeing in Canada a very big push uh, around jurisdictional roles and responsibilities from the federal and provincial government. Just recently in October, I think at the end of October, beginning of November, the first ministers met in uh, Halifax, where they said, Justin Trudeau, federal government, stay out of your lane, stay out of our lane and stay, don't deal with municipalities. That is our jurisdiction. We often hear on from municipal leaders that municipalities are children of the province. And if you tell a municipal leader that, they will scream and yell and <laughs> shout because they do not agree with that sentiment. But you you see two battling jurisdictional authorities, the province and the federal government, going at each other. And the municipalities are st stuck sort of being that child, and I asked this to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities President Scott Pierce recently, do you feel like the child between two arguing adults because no one seems to want to fix the issue. They just want to fight about the issue. And he said, well, we feel like the adult in the room because we're actually at the table waiting for the governments to come to the table, but they just won't. So there's that. There's that political aspect of this issue. So the province 
doesn't have money because they get the money from the federal government, but the federal government doesn't want to deal with the provinces and they want to deal with the municipalities. So it's a very weird Venn diagram of who has to deal with who every single week. The other issue is, you're right, polit uh, wastewater treatment facilities is not a sexy issue. Uh, during the Alberta provincial election, uh, uh, Penhold Mayor Mike Yargo, in a press conference that Alberta municipalities had, said, you do not expect a lot of ribbon cuttings, and I'm paraphrasing here, at a wastewater treatment facility, but because it's not sexy. And it's not. The average resident does not care. And I say that respectfully to our municipal leaders who are listening to this right now. But they should. Because when the waste, when the sewer backs up and the water doesn't turn on, who are they going to call? They're not going to call their MP. They're not going to call their uh, MLA. They're going to call their local elected leader. So there is that perspective as well, that it's just not a sexy subject. So you can't get buy-in from the general public around spending $2 million to upgrade a wastewater treatment facility when that doesn't seem like a natural photo opportunity where we can say, hey, look, we've done something. The other issue is planning. And it comes down to this asset management. In 2023, we have seen a big push for municipalities to start dealing with asset management programs, start planning for the future, stop sort of just assuming things are going to get fixed when they're going to get fixed, and actually start planning when things are going to get fixed. How long is it, that fire truck going to be aged out? How long is that pipe that's in the ground that's going to go to this section of your community uh, going to be viable until you are going to need to replace it? Asset management has been a big push for FCM, for a lot of those sort of provincial organizations. And I think from my perspective and from what I'm hearing, municipalities have got a handle on it. It comes back, though, to money. There's not enough money to go around and there's not enough municipalities who are willing to sort of harken back to that collaboration part, work collaboratively collaboratively with other municipalities to build sort of a wastewater treatment facility that will encompass six communities instead of just one small one to deal with 1,500 people instead of 30,000 people where they're working together. Yeah, which harkens back to our comments on collaboration a little bit earlier too and economies of scale. Something you said actually quite interested me in the Canadian Constitution says that feds have responsibilities, the provinces have responsibilities, and one of the things the provinces are supposed to do is look after municipal institutions. I think there are at least a couple of provinces now which have got their noses out of joint enough to create legislation that says federal government, thou shalt not deal with our municipalities. How do you think that's having an impact? Oh, that's going to, that's going to, that, that is the story that I'll be watching in 2024. If we talk about the future, that is the story I'm going to be watching in 2024. And the only reason I say that is because uh, one of those provinces is our home province of Alberta. Uh, so Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, uh, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. And if I'm not mistaken, PEI, we always forget about PEI, but I think PEI, all in that first minister's meeting said, we want the same recognition that Quebec gets. So in Quebec, in their constitution or in their uh, government overview, they have a bill that the federal government cannot negotiate with any municipality. They have to work uh, negotiate with the province and then the province of Quebec negotiates for all the members, uh, all the municipalities. So they get a big chunk of change instead of individually getting money, they get a big chunk of change. The issue is... All politics federally run through Quebec. So, <laughs> so we talk about dealing with the two different levels of government. When you want something, you if you want something had to happen federally, you deal with Quebec. Uh, the other provinces have the right to say they are the administers of the municipalities. Municipalities will say, well, no, we don't like that because we think we are an actual level of government. Because you have to remember in Canada, Municipalities are not a level of government. They are not recognized in our constitution as a level of government. They are an entity of the province. So I think the 2024 story that I'll be watching is this unfold is will Justin Trudeau meet with Doug Ford with uh, Scott Moe of uh, pre, uh, Daniel Smith, uh, Blaine Higgs, Tim Houston, Dennis King, and actually come to the table and negotiate for municipal funding to increase those infrastructures. Because municipalities, we, I, I said this at the beginning, I'm going to say it again. Municipalities are the front line. 
they are the front lines who are dealing with the issues that are uh, that are being sort of downloaded upon them by the province and federal government. They federal government and the provinces want more housing. Housing comes with infrastructure. If you don't have the infrastructures in place, those housings are not going to be built. I don't care where you are. If you do not have the accurate, uh, the appropriate infrastructure, you will are not going to see any housing built in 2024 or 2025 <laughs> to reach the targets that we need and potentially lower those prices of uh, house house prices in 2024. So that is the story I'll be watching. Cool. That's really that's good. And thanks so much for that. So uh, I want to say this has been a fascinating half hour conversation. Uh, it's always it's always good to look back on 2020, uh, whatever year we're in, whenever whatever year you're listening to this. But this is a timestamp of 2023 um, for you, Ian. Looking back on 2023, we've had some amazing guests on our show. You and I went through mm-hmm. sort of the uh, algorithms and sort of where we are and what people are listening to and what are what sort of provinces we're sort of getting traction in. Uh, looking back from a show's perspective, how do you think we're doing? It's been a lot of fun. Uh, the, the real focus on local government from coast to coast, I think, is really interesting because we can highlight some local stories that are representative of what's going on around the country. We've been able to look at some issues or topics or air subject matter areas that maybe we wouldn't have got to if we hadn't tried to figure out what the heck are we going to make work for the letter Q, for example. And if anybody has an idea for X, I think we could still use that. But I, to, or to Z. that end... Uh, <laughs> zebras so it's got to do with zoos maybe i don't know but anyway chris i think that uh, that's really given us a bit of a, a box to work in and it forced us to be kind of creative about this and seeing some of the statistics that we've got for people who are watching or listening and commenting uh, that's really been kind of gratifying i've really enjoyed it and one of the things that I, I i took away from that is we we seem to have a great following but I'm always one that, as I said in our last uh, show at the end of it, um, we always like to hear from you. Uh, we we called out for our listeners and our viewers to send in their submissions on what they thought were the biggest news stories. But we can always we always send in your stories throughout the year because we want to know what you're listening to. Because as we found out today, there are stories that we are missing and we want to hear from you. So if you have something, a news story, some policy that's going on in your community let us know so that way we can talk about it in a future episode of the show because this show is not just about uh, Ian and myself. This show is about you, the listeners, you, the viewers who are taking time out of your busy schedules to sit down and wake up with us on Sunday mornings from time to time and listen to the show. Um, but for me, 2023 has been a blast on the political trenches, local government at work. Ian, it has been an honor to sit down with you from, if I'm not mistaken, and I apologize for those who are about to correct my math here, because Ian and I are not great at math. That's what we're <laughs> about to find out. But uh, from what I understand, we have done 20 episodes in 2020, uh, 2023. Uh, that's special episodes with Bucking the Trend. That's all the letters of the alphabet that we've gone through. And I could not have asked for a better co-host for 2023. I can't wait to see what happens in 2024, Ian. I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what 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 more interesting news stories happened over the next 12 months in 2024? What about yourself? It is going to be neat. And to me, one of the really gratifying things is all of the stories we talked about today were all all came from suggestions over the last few weeks. Yeah. Uh, we probably would have come up with some of them, as you have said. We wouldn't have come up with others, but it's really cool that we're talking about things that other people are interested in, too. So it's been a lot of fun to be able to work with you over the last year, too, Chris. So with that, this is the last episode of 2023 for the local, uh, the political trenches, local government at work. You think after a year and a half, I'd be able to get the name right, but I almost screwed it up there. Uh, Ian, we will be back in 2024. Until then, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. And to our listeners and to our viewers, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's. Have a safe holidays. And please remember, do not drink and drive. Please call someone if you need to drive. Thanks, everybody.